Father God, we're so thankful to still be in the land of the living. We're thankful for health and strength. And we're thankful, Father, for who you are. We're thankful, Father, that you have saw fit to still keep us in the land of the living. We're thankful, Father, that you are who you are. And we're thankful to know you for who you are. So we're, we pray right now, Father, that you would just bless this service. Bless those who came out. Bless those who are watching online. Bless those who are just searching for a place to hear a word about you. We're thankful, Father, for Asaw Community Church, where serving and giving begins. We're thankful for the membership. We're thankful for the friends. And we're thankful for the visitors. And we ask right now, Father, that you use me to give your people the word to strengthen their lives and make their tomorrow better than their today. So bless us now as we go forth in this worship experience, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeanette. I am so thankful to be here, to be the pastor of Asaw Community Church with Serving and Giving Begins. Um, as a lot of people know, I have spent my life over the last 30-something, 30 30 plus years as a professional comedian, and the other day they started calling me to offer me dates to go back out on the road. And my friend said to me, or he asked me, was I excited? And I said, not really. Um, not really excited about it. I mean, I, I, something that I have to do that I understand we all must work. But I told him, I said, there's something about preparing the word of God for the people of God that gives you so much more joy. It, it, it's like I got to go because there's some things that I have to do. I'm just not finished. But, but the moment that the God allows me to step away from that, I, I've heard a lot of people laugh. I'm, I, I just want you to know it's, it's for the money now. It, that's all it is. It's, it's, a, it's a money grab. That's what we call it, a money grab, because the things that made it unique have uh, gone by the wayside. But this is always uh, fulfilling. It's, it's always, uh, I'm always looking forward to it. And, and I know every preacher who has an opportunity to preach feels the same way because it's something about sharing the word of God to the people of God. So with that being said and done, I will be traveling in the coming months, but I have some people that will be stepping in my place that are capable to do what? Bring you a word, which is what we come here for, and for you to go out there and magnify the Lord's name to the people who do not know him. And there's a lot of people who do not know him. So with that being said, we have been dealing with uh, a series of, of parents and instructions and what does God expect for, from us? What is God expecting from us and, and his children? And when you are a child, we are taught by parents. Parents are the ones that have the responsibility to teach us. Now, the problem is, is who's teaching you, what are they teaching you, and how are you applying the lesson? Uh, see, we, send, we tend to take responsibility based upon our teaching. And I'm here to tell you that if you teach the truth, the rest is up to the hearer. God is going to protect those who, to hear the word, or hear the truth. If you apply it. And, and so I know a lot of mothers are, are, are praying over their children that when they leave, they are fearful that they may not return. But I'm here to encourage you that if you raise your children in truth, and the truth and love of God is embedded in your heart and passed into their hearts, you can pray for them, but God already has them because there are some things that the heart will not allow to happen. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I had a mother that worked very hard to make sure that I had an opportunity in life. And therefore, uh, uh, more importantly, it was important for me not to give her a bad or a negative story to tell her friends. Every day, the mothers in my neighborhood would walk from the bus stop to their respective homes and they would talk about their children. And I remember her coming home and telling me some of the negative things of some of the other mothers had to experience. And because of the love I had for her that was in my heart, I didn't want to disappoint her to be one that would have a bad story. That was a choice. That was a choice. And so when you see the word children, you know they have to be the responsible or be be. be um, uh, 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 you see the word children, that there should be responsible parents. And in the case of the children of Israel, God was the parent. 
But he sent a teacher named Moses. And Moses had to command the children of Israel that before they entered the, the land that was promised to them, that there were some, some laws and some commands and some statutes that they had to do what? Obey. That, that, that's, the, that's the word with us. That's the word that kind of gets us in trouble. We can hear a lot of stuff, but are we willing to obey? And so Moses is given this assignment that, that he has to give them the instructions for the parents to raise their children, to prepare them to not only have reverence for God, but honor God, love God. So when they go into this land that is promised, basically they'll know how to act. That's basically what us, our parents do. They, they teach us at home how to act in public. And, and I don't know about y'all, but I grew up in a time that if you acted out in public, a parent took it personal, like they didn't give you what they call home training. But it's a parent's job to teach. And we, the children, become the product of what we are taught. So when you are disappointed in some things, sometimes you got to take a step back and go, well, what did I teach? What did I teach? What, it was my responsibility to teach. What, what did I teach? And so our parents must have a relationship with us that involves communicating. Sometimes I hear parents say, oh, I, I don't talk to my child that often. And, I'm, and I wonder, how come you don't talk to your child that often if in raising them, you taught them, you, 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 you talk to them? There has to be a relationship. I, 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 I don't know how you can go so, so long without talking to them because if you establish that relationship, then you're always yearning on both ends to communicate. I mean, there's some siblings that don't talk that often. But then when you look at their youth, they didn't talk in their youth. So I'm, I'm not surprised that they don't talk today when they didn't even talk then. But I'm just setting the stage for where I'm going today. I'm just, just trying to get your mind open and thinking about the relationship between parent and children and what does God expect of us? What does God expect of us? So let's look at it. Let's look at it. Tonight we're going to come from the Old Testament. We're going to look at Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Now I'm going to read all nine verses, but my focus will be on verses 7, 8, and 9. And it reads... Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life and that your days will be prolonged therefore hear O Israel and be careful to observe it that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. My sermon title is called, What You Are Comes From Them. What you are comes from them. 
We spend our lives blaming them and they. Who told you that? They said, who's they? Them. So what we are comes from them. What we are comes from them. Who are them? Our parents. Whether you had them or not, whether you had good ones or bad ones or half or one or adopted, fostered, what we are as children are minds waiting to be molded by those who are responsible for us. I, I can't, if, if, if my granddaughter does something that's crazy, immediately y'all gonna look at me because I'm the responsible adult in her life because she's a child. And just like the children of Israel, although they were adults, they were still children. And God, as their father, wanted to prepare them for what he had given them. He was going to give them. They were going to receive an inheritance. Do you know the beautiful part about an inheritance? If you're smart, if you're wise, somebody else has already paid the price. That's why it's called an inheritance. You are inheriting what I've already done. And because I've already done it, I know the lessons that you must learn to appreciate what I paid the price for. That's, that's parenting. That's, that's, that's parenting that there's some things that we, 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 we have to understand when we're walking in favor or we're walking into our destiny or we're walking into our inheritance. There's some things that come along with it because if you don't understand the inheritance, you won't appreciate it. You won't appreciate it. You won't appreciate when somebody just hands it to you. But if you were taught, and if you saw the example, and if it is embedded in your heart, not only would you appreciate it, they'll have value. My mother and father are long gone, but I still honor them in what? My actions. Because it was something that they instilled in us that I want to make sure that I, that I honor, that I have reverence for. That's why it says to, to fear God. And I told you, it's not to fear to be trembling. It's to fear in awe, in reverence of that. I don't want to disappoint. I don't want to disappoint. It, that, that's like, listen, if you have some, some pride about you, if you have some, um, they say, some get up and go about you, there are some things that you just don't want to lack when other people are watching. Listen, when somebody comes in and says that this church is clean and, and everything functions, that's a testament to God because we don't want you to see that why would they be struggling if they serve this awesome God? We want you to walk in and be in awe. Because that's taught to have reverence for what God has blessed you to have. So we, we shouldn't be trying to mess it up. We should always be trying to build it up. But it has to be, like in verse 6, it has to be in your, in your heart. That's what it says in verse 6. Verse 6 it says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Because if it's in your heart, guess what's going to happen? It's going to move throughout your actions. If we have love for what we have love for, it will, it will resonate in our, in our actions. And so if we have love for our children, our actions should exemplify that. Now, I, know, I know this might mess a lot of people up. Sometimes it makes people mad when I say it, but you can say how much you love me. But if your actions don't line up, you, 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 you're, wasting, you're wasting your breath on me. You, uh, you, you, I love you, but I can't come home. I love you, but I got extra marital affair. I love you, but I don't bring home. I love you, but I won't work. That, 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 to me, that ain't love. Somebody got to show me another chapter and verse. Because God said that he loves you and he exemplifies it by doing what? Putting up with you time and time again. So we have to teach him. That responsibility is on the mothers and fathers. Now, I know a lot of homes are broken, and, and so all I am saying is that if when you get this revelation, when you get this knowledge, and then you get the full understanding, you can pick it up from there. Because all of us were not born saved. All of us did not come from Christian homes. But at this particular time, at this particular time, in these Jewish families, they were, they were one. Everybody was from everybody the same. It wasn't all of these blended families that we are forced with today. I'm just setting it up from here, how we get to today. 
So what Moses is telling them is based upon the law back then. He's preparing them to go into a land that was promised to them. Here's some things that you got to understand. And if you understand it, God has said, if you obey my ordinances, if you obey my commands, if you obey my statutes, long life. Long life. And so Moses is given the assignment. And so when we get down to verse 7, it says, you, meaning you, you parents, you shall teach them diligently. What should you teach them? The way of the Lord. The way of the Lord. And, and when, when you see the word diligently, that means again and again and again. You, you can't be mad because they don't pick their shoes up the first time you tell them. Because you're teaching them. But you got to teach them why. What's the importance of it? Whenever we correct, there should be some understanding, some why, some importance of why there is correction. So he says, you shall teach them diligently. To what? Your children. Why? Because you just saw in the previous verse, it says, to you and your father and your son and your grandfather and your grandson you know what that is that's teaching generation after generation after generation so if in my family if my father started his day with prayer and taught me to start my day with prayer and i taught my son to start his day with prayer by the time my great great grandson come along prayer is every day it's 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 it's, it's part of who we are so Moses is telling them, hey, before we go over there, here's some things that you got to understand. The Bible clearly says that iron sharpens iron. And you hear that all the time, but you got to understand how strong is iron. And in order to get it stronger, you have to grind it against some more iron. It's not soft. So we have to have strength. And our children must be taught with Diligence, diligently and diligence, meaning patience must be exuded. You can't come down on them because they don't get it, because if that's the case, the father could come down on you because we don't get it. How many times has he had to tell you to do the same thing over and over? So teaching requires patience, diligence, consistency, care. There must be passion connected to the teaching. See, that's why this beautiful that's why the Bible is so beautiful, because every, every aspect of it is, 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 is passion. So when you're, when you're talking to someone, you're talking to them with the passion because the words were written in love. The word was written to love you. So therefore, every time you hear it, it should do something to you because it's a love story between God and you. And all we are responsible for is, is the teaching it. To love, to have reverence, to worship, to serve God. That's what we're teaching. And if we teach that in our families, it will be passed down because everything that is taught is passed down. Whether you like it or not, things that are taught. If you ignore your child, they will ignore you. They're going to ignore theirs. If we don't drift too far away from the way we are taught, we're either going to be just like or the opposite. You know we are. My father used to yell. When he wanted us, he'd call. He'd call your name. Your whole body would just tremble. Rodney, Yes. Give me some ice cream. Thank you, Jesus. Because he would say it like it was an emergency. And, and I was the same way. My kids, I call them. I didn't have to call my kids twice. I called them one time. Whatever they were doing, they stopped, sir. But my brother, same father, didn't like that. Very gentle. Now, he, he raised his voice. But by the time he raised his voice, he didn't say something to you three, four times. So I'm just trying to tell you what we were taught, how it passes down. To each generation. So it says you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you should talk to them when you sit in your house. Oh, that's, that's powerful. So you should talk to them diligently. And you should talk to them. Meaning you got to have a conversation. That means that you're in relationship with them because you're talking to them. But you're talking to them from a place where you have authority. Your house. Your house, not, not your mama's house, not your granny's house, not your auntie's house, your uncle's house. It's, it's your house. Men and, men and women ought to have an authority, a place that where I live, I can say what I want to say and how I want to say it because it's my house. It's my house. I don't have to walk on eggshells in my house. 
But when you're in somebody else's house, you have to respect the authority and the leadership of that home, whether, whether they're your son or not. So, so he says to teach them, and you shall talk, talk of them, talk of them, talk of them, meaning the word of God. That should be your conversation. The reason why our people don't, don't do well in life, because our conversation is, who's the greatest, LeBron or Michael Jordan? There's some other things that we need to be talking about. Now, I don't have no problem watching the game, but if that dominates the conversation, if you haven't given your son the responsibility and the instructions on how to be a man and how to provide, don't get upset when they're all living in your house. And y'all know how I feel about children grown living in my house. You come back to my house as an adult, I'm going to treat you like you was nine. Well, I'm 35 years old, not here. Not here. You come home at 9 o'clock, Dad, I'm a grown man. But then the grown men don't live here. It's only one grown in this house. But, 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 but again, what did you teach them? What did they learn? What did they apply? You shall teach them with diligence to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. These things that Moses is telling the parents is how to keep your children and the family connected to God. When you're sitting in your house, it says, then it says, when you walk by the way, meaning wherever you go in life, there's a conversation about God. There's a conversation to impact your life. There's a conversation to improve your life. Why? Because it's our conversation that's in our heart. If, if, if it's in my heart, when I'm talking to my friends, what's in my heart will come out. When I'm on the golf course, we're talking about salvation. We're talking about ministry. We're talking about the lack thereof or the fullness thereof. We're not talking about the girl that's coming, serving us on the cart and what she got on. Oh yeah, don't act like we don't see, but it's not part of the conversation. Not part of the conversation. So this happens in your home, and the home is important because there's no place like home. No matter where you go in life, there's no place like home. You can go on the best vacation in the world, but you can't wait to get back home. Why would Moses say to create this atmosphere in the home? Because one, that's where you're going to spend most of the time. Two, that's where trust should be developed. Three, that's where provision is. Four, that's where security is. It's something about a home that you should be in awe. Of wanting to be there because of what comes out of there. But if your house ain't in awe, then what happens? You are attracted to some other things. So when you walk by the way, as it says here, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise, what is he saying? He is saying then it's still prevalent today. We have to submerge ourselves in understanding what does God expect? I am telling you, just like he said here, you will have a long life. Your life will be better. Your choices will be better. Your path will be better. Your relationships will be better because you understand why you respond the way you respond. So this relationship should be wherever you go. It shouldn't be here, just here, because sometimes you know how it is. We get to church and we get super saved. That's a super salvation in church. But if you really want to see a church operate Outside of the will of God, go to a church meeting. And the church is run by some deacons. Yeah, and they got a new pastor. And they got some people that have been there over 40 years. You ain't going to see no, I've been to some of them. Oh, you ain't been to my church. I've been to some of them. Wherever you go, wherever you are, you will not be ashamed of the gospel because it's in your heart. But you got to teach him. And it's your responsibility as a parent to teach him. What are you teaching them? Because whatever they are, it comes from you. Whatever they are comes from you. Well, I can't take that responsibility. They made their own choices. Well, that's because life will. It says that they will depart. But it also says they're going to come on back. It's in. It's, it's in you. It's in you. It's, it, 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 comes, it comes a time when you, have, when you have known something, you can run, but you're going to come back. Why? Because truth always comes back. So when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, your day, your conversation, your teaching should be about life and how to have it more abundantly. 
when you walk by the way. Walking and talking and seeing. God, that's why I tell everybody, my wife and I will tell you, we walk. You know why when you walk? You know what happens when you walk? Connection. Walking, because that's what it says. When you walk, it didn't say when you run, when you drive, when you ride, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you ride, because there's something about walking that builds connection. When you are walking, you can communicate. When you are walking, you are focused on whoever is with you in that, that comes. There's no other distractions. There's some things happening around you that you can see the beauty of God and you can see God working and you can, it's something about a day. It's something about a gentle breeze that just, it just does something to you. You don't even know what it does. It's something about that cool breeze that just comes by and you feel it. And you go, oh, it's a great day to be alive. When you lie down and rise up, you got to teach them that at the end of the day, in the beginning of the day, God, if we get up every morning and pray and if we go to bed every night and pray, if even if that was your last night, at least you left out of here and pray. See, that's why I hate when people say, oh, I wish I had a, do it, do it. Oh, something happened, oh, I wish I had a, do it, do it. When you lie down or when you rise up, you should begin each day with prayer. However you start your day, however you start your day will impact your day. So prayer must be taught. And when it's taught, it must be believed that it works. And we should pray for them in the morning. And pray with them in the evening. Let's go to verse 8. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as the frontlets between your eyes. Well, let's look at it another way. Tie them around your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Remember when we was kids and sometimes you couldn't remember stuff. They would tie something around your finger. Or it was something to remind you of what you were supposed to do. That's all this is. It's a, it's a reminder of what you're supposed to do. You got you to gotta teach them what they're supposed to do. And if they, they can't remember the first time, because you've got to remember now, when this was written, everybody didn't have Bibles. Everybody didn't have internet. So they, they, they went to the, to the temple and they were here, and then they would write it down, and they would carry it around with them as a reminder. We got Bibles on, uh, on CD and everywhere, but we still don't open it up all the time. We got access. So Moses is saying to them, hey, listen, you're going to teach them. You're going to teach them about prayer. You're going to be a part of the conversation, but you, you, shall, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between, between your eyes. Why? To remind you of where you're going based upon Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their life, their work. And now you are going to be beneficiaries of their inheritance that I promised them. So tie something around you to remember. Um, when I was a kid, we moved into this community that was... Um, I don't know, it was predominantly Jewish. And when we moved in, we had this little thing on the door. And I can't remember the name of it. It was called, um, what was that thing called? Uh, man, let me see if I wrote it down. It was called the, man, I can't even figure out where I wrote it down. I know I wrote it down. See, this is what happens when you get so excited. I don't know if you've ever been so excited, you're writing, and then you jot something down, and then you look for it, and you say, well, where is it? And you can't find it, and then you, you say, well, I know I wrote it down, and then I always say, well, maybe the Lord just didn't want me to talk about that, so let me go on to something else. What was that thing called? Oh, here it is. A mezuzah. A mezuzah. Mezuzah. And it's a little thing that the Jewish people would write inscriptions on, roll them up, and, and, and put it at their door. So every morning as they would leave, they would touch it or kiss it or pray. It would remind them of whose they were. And so that's what happens to our children. We don't have no identifying factors to remind them who they are. They just walk out. They just walk out. You ever go to see the Showtime at the Apollo and before somebody could even take the stage, they got to touch the rock. And if they didn't touch the rock, the whole audience would be like, hey, 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 hey. But that's a reminder of all the greatness that has taken place on this stage. And everybody touches, the, I think it was a tree stump. 
Everybody. That's what this is. When he says to remind them, to bind them, to remind them of who you are and where you're going. And, and, and guess what? You, you can put it all over. You can just put it wherever you need to remind yourself. Remind yourself of what God has done and is doing before you enter this land. What if we had that? What if we just taught that? What, if, what kind of impact would that have on the ones that we know? If every day, that we, if every day we, we, we woke our children up and we prayed with them and we gave them one scripture, they ain't got to give them the whole, I just give them one scripture. What, what kind of impact would they have on their lives going forward? And then every once in a while we find one that really resonates and we just write that down and, and, and put it in a little capsule and put it around that net. God will always be with you. He'll never put on you more than you can bear. All things work for the good. Something like that. And, and then you know what would happen? You know what would happen? I can tell you what would happen. Every time there was a situation, you would go what? Fall back on what you were taught. What God has promised you. So it says, you shall bind them as a sign on your, on your hand and, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes, why? Why your hands and your eyes? Why is that so significant? It didn't say tied around your knee. It didn't say tied around your foot. But your hands touch what your eyes see. So God wants to remind you that what you see and what you touch. But if your heart is connected to your hands and your eyes, it's going to be pure. Is there going to be temptation? Absolutely. That's, there would be no life without it. There was no need to depend on God if there was not the temptation out there. But, but, but if you got your hands prayed for, if you got your eyes prayed for, then what's in your heart? Got to teach it to our children. It's what's in your heart that God is looking at. He's looking at your heart. He's looking at your actions. He's looking at your hands. He's looking at what you're seeing. And every time you see something that's not of God, remember, he's watching it with you. What if we told our children that? Let's look at verse number nine. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What is, what, is, what, is, what is Moses saying to the people? What is Moses charging the parents with? He's charging the parents with the authority and the responsibility to raising their children in awe of God. Because that's who we worship. We don't worship all these different God. We worship a true and living God. One. It says God is one. God is. So, so, so what we're doing is if we, if we remind you by teaching you and talking to you and, and being in conversation with you and being in fellowship with you and then we, we, we put it around your, 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 your eyes and we put it on your hands then you see it as you coming and going. It's hard to be disruptive or corruptive or, or corruption to get in when God is present. When God is present, how do you know? How do, how do you know? You know why? Because I had some cousins that was crazy. Because we all do. We all got a family full of crazy folks. But when they got to my grandmama house, they would tell them friends that they was crazy. Hey, 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 calm down, be quiet. Going to my grandmother's house. Because that's how she raised us. She would tell you, don't bring that up in here. Don't bring them spirits up in here. And even the hardest criminal would say, yes, ma'am. Because of the God that she served. Because of what she taught. Because of how she lived. Because of what we saw in her. And that's all Moses is telling us. That's all he's telling you. That's all we're telling each other today. Listen, if you're waiting on Allen Iverson, to save your child, keep waiting. It's your responsibility. They talk about Charles Barkley. I'm not a role model. You're a basketball player. You made a lot of money. People are looking at you. But, but it's not Charles Barkley's responsibility for what God has entrusted in your care. You ought to be your child's number one role model, number one hero. But you can't be that if you're not in a relationship. You can't be that if you're not talking to them. You can't be that if you're not teaching them. You can't be that if you're not the example. You can't even be that if you're not there. And all I'm saying to you this evening 
is that God is asking parents, I don't care where y'all are in the relationship, come together for the sake of the children and teach them while they're walking, while they're rising, while they're laying down, while they're sitting, so when they go out, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. Listen, it's our responsibility. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. Here's my responsibility. Give the people a word that they can utilize. The people hear the word. They apply the word. And in applying the word, they are teaching the word to those who do not know the word and growing with those who know the word. But it's all part of the journey, it's all part of the conversation. But the key is for you to be obedient to the word, for you to apply it. I'm not gonna force nobody. I'm not gonna force, that's not my job. I talked to a lady today, she said, you're celebrating three years, how do you feel? I said, I feel just as good as I did when I first started. And they always ask you the number one question. How many members? How many members do you have? I said, the same. I said, for 12, five show up. And then she said, the question I always get asked second, how does that make you feel? And I say the same thing every time. I have an assignment. I have an assignment. That's it. I don't worry about the numbers. You know, I, you, no, you, 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 you worry about the numbers. That's what they want to tell you. You worry about the numbers. No, let me tell you why I don't worry about the numbers. It's just like I never worried about it in the career. I didn't worry about their money. I worried about the gig. I had to do it. And I did it to the best of my ability. And each time I did it, I was rewarded. And people ask me, they go, man, I can't believe you did comedy all those years and I, I never heard of you. I know a lot of people that you heard of and they're not successful, struggling, struggling. It's not, success is not whether or not you know me. Success is whether or not you happy in what you're doing. If I'm happy with my children, happy with my wife, happy with my life, if I'm pleasing God, that's the assignment. So, so the numbers, the numbers are the numbers. I know some churches that are filled, filled, but also know it's a great turnover. There's no sustaining. I say I still got the same 12. So the doors of the church are open. Here at Asaw, if you want to be a member, all you got to do is fill out this card. I want to be a member. Answer two questions on the back. Why do you want to be a member of this church? And what ministry would you like to serve in? Why are they important? Here's why they're important. Because you ought to know why you want to be a member anyway. And if you are at a place and you don't know why you're there, it's time to go. Because you ought to know. Don't say, well, because my mama go here. Don't say, because my daddy used to be the pastor here. Don't say, because my brother the pastor. If your soul, if your life is not being fed, then, then what are you doing? Because that's what we come here for. We come here to eat. And if we take the meal and we go out and share it, that, that's, that's the only reason I've been a member of a church. I ain't been a member of church because it looked good. I ain't been a member of church because it's right across the street. I've been a member because I felt the teaching impact and improve my life. If that's happening, you should be a member. Why should you be a member, be a part of a ministry? Because like it said, you shall talk, you shall sit, you shall walk, you shall rise, you shall lay. Why? In a ministry, you talk about all that. LaDonna and her girlfriends walk every Monday. I see them Mondays at 5.30 in the morning. Ask them what kind of conversation they have. I bet you it's about life. It's about you about what God. Matter of fact, when I first saw her, she said, hey, that's him. Which means if she said that's him, then somewhere along the line in the conversation, she said, hey, I met this crazy pastor. And I just happened to show up on my bicycle. But that's what ministry is. When it comes to giving, I had this conversation too. <laughs> Lady asked me, she said, Three years, how have you survived? I said, because I taught people to give. And people understand that giving blesses them. And when people understand the power of giving, you don't have to ask them to give. 
That's it. They give whatever they want to give. See, we don't, I try to stay away from titles. I try not to call it nothing other than the fact, bless God for what he's done in your life. If he ain't done nothing, then go on about your business. But if he's done something, if he's given you some authority over some things, you just got to give. It ain't amazing. He just you say, give me back a piece and see what I do. So, so when, when people come to me and they're struggling financially, first thing I ask them, what's your giving like? What's your giving like? Because I'm telling you right now, everybody that I know that gives, there may be some lean days, but, but they have all that they need. I ain't talking about what you want. I know you want to go to Hawaii, but you can't get to Hawaii right now. Save your money. I'm talking about your need. Got a roof over your head. No, I can tell you right now, no ASAR member was evicted during this pandemic. And y'all know I helped some people put some, some stuff on some, 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 some trucks. And, and, and we helped them. And we helped these people. And they said, and they always say the same classic thing. Oh, thank you. And we're going to stop by. Matter of fact, I saw a guy that we, the church, bought some food for last month. He was over here doing some laundry. And I said, man, you look familiar. And then I said, oh. That's the guy we bought the food for. I said, hey, man, we bought the food for you. He said, oh, yeah. He said, this is where your church is? I said, yeah. He said, man, I thought the church was in Douglasville. He didn't never say he was coming. He didn't never say he was going to stop by. He just said, oh, that's where you are. I'm going to tell you right now, we've been here three years. I think we've only seen one or two people that we ever helped. But guess what we keep doing? The assignment. Because if, if, I, if I stop the assignment based upon what people have done, didn't Jesus heal some lepers? And he said, hey, what, what? you're the only one? And every time people don't say thank you, every time people don't do their part, I got to remember, Jesus healed the lepers and only one came back. So when it comes to giving, whatever God has blessed you with, you can give here or you can go online, ASAWCC. Dot O R G, because my wife don't like when I say O R G, because I say it kind of funny. So there it is, right there. A S A W C C dot O R G. And you know what else I get? People go, "What's that again?" And I tell them, they go, oh, "Okay, I'm gonna do it when I get home." That's like when they miss your birthday. You don't get that gift. You ain't never got that missed birthday gift in your life. I don't even get upset. You know why? Because the giving blesses you. It blesses you, allows us to do what we got to do. So if you want to give, just give. ASAWCC.org. But I guarantee you this. The more you give, the more you can expect. Not, let me get this straight now, because I don't want nobody saying that's like dollar for dollar. No, no, no. Your whole life, your children, your jobs, those, those, those unexpected raises. Matter of fact, I went to my account this morning, and I saw three times the money that I had in there. And I said, my, look, I had just read my cousin talking about he moved to Dallas because God told him to move to Dallas and then God blessed him with a job and a promotion. And it was a great move because he, he followed, he was obedient to the word of God and the call of God. And I go check my account this morning and I see this extra money in there and I tremble because I'm saying, Lord, did it happen to me? And then I went to my account and realized I had paid the bill for my mother-in-law because she didn't want to use her credit card, and then she gave me the check to pay the bill. And then I was like, oh, because I was getting ready to come in here tonight, boy. Boy, I'm telling you, because I kept going, where this money? Hey, where did money come from? And then I go, oh, that's the check she gave me yesterday. I forgot all about it. But for a minute, boy, I was getting ready to have a testimony tonight on some giving. Do you know that? Do you know that favor that God just finds? And then I was like, well, how did he get it in my account so fast? What is so anyway. Uh, September the 21st, I believe, we'll come back to our Bible study, our Tuesday Town Hall. So that covers just about everything. We talked about the offering. We talked about this. Um, everybody's doing well. Roger and Gloria on vacation because you know I believe in vacation. You should take them. <laughs> we only come in this way one time. So take as many as you can take. And you ain't got to spend a lot of money. You ain't got to spend a lot of money. Go to one of them times. Share. They give you three days and four days. Four days and three nights. You know you ain't going to buy it. You ain't getting over. They want you to come in because they think they're going to get you. That's part of their job. <laughs> so go on and get you one of them free four days, three nights, and then go to another one the next week. I'm you. Okay, y'all think I'm joking. I got about two of them. We got, my wife and I got, went to one. They gave us another week. We got a week already lined up to go somewhere else. I'm, whatever. I'm going to go to a time shed. I'm going to say, no, sir, I'm not interested. No, sir, I'm not interested. They're going to get mad, walk off, try to put pressure on me. 
I'm going to hold the fort. Then I'm going to look at the town. I'm going to go, okay, we out of here. And then they're going to go, what can we do to make this deal? I'm going to go, nothing. Just give me the free stuff that y'all promised me. Matter of fact, the first iPad we bought for the church came from a time shed. They gave us $150. I said, shoot, we need a time. We need an iPad. Yes, we go. My wife told me, I don't like going in there. You make me nervous. Them people trying to eat. I said, so are we. Now, come on. Get sit down. <laughs> Our anniversary is next weekend. Looking forward to it. Friday night comedy show. Saturday night, Reverend, uh, Reverend Waters will be preaching. Uh, from Augusta, Georgia, uh, Sean will sing and we'll have a jazz saxophone uh, and a keyboard accompanist for, for the entertainment that night. Food will be good, fellowship be good. We thank y'all for coming. Father God, we're so thankful for this church, thankful for the hearts and minds of the people. I ask right now a special prayer on my friend Bone. You know his situation, his health needs, as he's dealing with health issues down in Dallas. He has his family and friends there to support him. We just ask a special prayer, Father, that you would heal him. Because in due time, Father, when you decide to, to raise him up from his affliction, we know he's going to have a word for us. And something's going to change and shift in his life that's going to shift in ours because we're going to hear a testimony because he's been close to the end, but you have kept him. So we ask you to continue to pray for him and bless him and keep him. And bless all the members. And bless our members that are away traveling. Give them safe traveling grace at their return. And bless us, Father, as we depart from this place, but never from your presence in Jesus' name. Amen.